Well, let's get started in Acts. Let's pray real quick, though, if you would. Bow your heads with me. Oh, dear Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for these men and women that you have brought together, that um, you have just put a desire to learn in their hearts, Lord, and you have brought them here to be together, to meet new people. Lord, I pray that you bind us together as a family, that you uh, just... Just bring us together in your name, Lord, that I pray that your presence is upon this room today as we fellowship in your name, as we come to learn a little bit about you. I pray that you open our hearts and our minds to learn, that you would whisper a new message in our ears, that you would teach us afresh today, Lord. Um, just be near us today. In your name we pray, amen. All right, if you would, I have these two guys. You're going to need this one first, but have them both at the ready. So we are actually, before we look at the text itself, I do want to give you a little bit of background into the book of Acts, starting with the author. Okay, so we call this man Luke. Luke is also attributed to writing the gospel of Luke, and it is a two-part book. Luke, however, does not actually name himself in either one of these books. This man named Irenaeus, who was a church founding father, uh, he lived, he was born 130 AD, and he was martyred in 202 AD, I believe, in Rome. Um, but in, he wrote a, a couple of documents, and one of them was called Against the Heresies. And in this third Against the Heresies book, he names Luke as the writer of the Gospel of Luke and Acts. So that's where we get this name, this man, Luke. That's what we call him. This name, after Irenaeus names him, it was never challenged. Um, and so we have adopted it, and that's, that's how we name this man, and that's what we call him. Um, he was a very, very learned man. Um, typically, he's regarded to be a doctor, um, possibly a lawyer. Most of the scholarship that I've read now really thinks he was probably a doctor. But either way, what is very much um, well agreed upon is that he is very well learned in rhetoric especially, which is the way that they would argue a point, they would uh, give a message. Um, both Luke and Acts are considered to be rhetorical masterpieces. He was very, 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 very smart. Um, most likely this man was not part of the elite of society, but he was welcomed in the elite of society, which again, if he was a doctor, he would have had these people as patients, he would have known these people. So he was, excuse me, he was definitely welcomed within. Um, and so, uh, we will see that when we look at um, the introductions to both Luke and Acts. Um, one thing that you'll see about Luke, uh, and you'll see you have blanks here to fill in. I need to write things, so I fear you do too. Um, he is deeply, deeply convinced that Christianity is inclusive to all ethnicities, all social strata, and both genders. And we will see that if you look and pay attention when you're going through Acts, the examples that he uses, when he talks about people and points people out, there's always men and women, rich and poor, Jew and Gentile. He wants to make sure that we understand that there is no bridge that Christianity cannot cross. It is for everybody. And that we can see through Luke. He doesn't, he doesn't typically say much in words, but the examples he uses, that's where we see his theology come out. So be on the lookout for that. Little interesting tidbit there. Uh, the date, typically they say it was written between 70 and 80, 70 AD and 80 AD, uh, most likely late 70s type. Um, and the genre, really interesting here. We look at it as a historical document, and in fact it was. Um, but it is specifically called hysteri historiography, which is, um, you know, the history of today is very scientific. We need to know exactly when, exactly how. You need every single detail. 
back then in antiquity, that was not the name of the game. They didn't do that. They don't care, and you'll notice in, in Acts, it's like sometime later, a little while later, it's not three days or three months or two years, it's just hmm, a little while later. Because really, the timing did not much matter to them. His purpose was to give a chronological accounting that was factual in order, but it held a message. Historiography was very much um, about giving a message, using the facts that happened in history to promote his understanding. And so um, it is not, again, like I said, we will not see dates. We will not see all of these little details that we think should be included in a historical document like we have today. Does that make sense? All right. So his purpose, this is the second volume in a two-volume book, essentially. The Gospel of Luke is the first one. Acts is the second. So the Gospel of Luke is, um, what's interesting, they're roughly the exact same length. They both fill up one full papyrus, which was their writing, uh, what they wrote on in that time. And so they're very close in word count, and they both span about 30 years. Luke goes from Jesus' birth to Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension. Acts, we will see, goes from the ascension all the way through to the end of Paul. And so you'll see 30 years in, a, in both books, but you cannot read these one without the other. Because what you find is in Luke, all of these, it lays the foundation for the themes and theologies that you find in Acts. And also there will be themes and theologies that are begun in Luke that are not really discussed in fully until Acts. And so we are able to look back when we see something in Acts, we can look back to Luke and say, oh, this is where that started. And so when we look at the purpose, we're actually going to start in Luke 1. So if you would turn your Bibles or your Bible app or whatever you have, um, it actually should be on the screen to Luke 1. It begins with a dedication to Theophilus says, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught." I love this last, the last phrase of this. This is really where we see the purpose of both Luke and Acts, that we may have certainty of what we have been taught. This word certainty is asphalela in Greek. That's the Greek word, and I just like saying it because it's fun. So asphalela, it means that there is an unarguable conclusion so, what Luke is telling us in this last phrase of Luke 1, 4 is that we can have certainty of the unarguable conclusion of the gospel. It means unarguable fact. It means that there's so much evidence that he has gone around and collected so much evidence of eyewitness accounts that we cannot even argue with the conclusion. We cannot argue with what he says is fact because there have been so many people that saw it, that were eyewitnesses, and they all agree upon what happened. So we can have certainty, we can rest that this is true. We don't have to wrestle with that. He's done it for us. He's done the work to show us this is what happened. Not only can we rest with certainty, but we can have security in it. And what I mean by that is that the world tells us so many times that, that the idea of Christ, of his resurrection, is ridiculous. The fact that a man would die, people would see him die, and that he would be raised from the dead, doesn't make sense. And it doesn't to our, 
to our way of thinking, to this world. It doesn't make sense. But Luke is telling us that there's so much evidence that we can rest securely against these, the lies that the adversary, he twists the truth just enough to make you doubt, just enough to make you wonder, is this real? And he is saying, yes, it is unarguable that this is real, that this is true. We can rest securely. We can rest with security in what we read in both the Gospel of Luke and in Acts. I love that. So if you notice, we talked about this man named Theophilus in Luke 1.3. And then as we flip to Acts, it says, in the first book, O Theophilus. So who is this dude, Theophilus? That's the question. He is the one to whom both narratives are written. He is the one that we believe is the money man behind Luke's work. He is the one that backed, he gave him the money, the funds necessary so that Luke could go out and, because he had to do extensive research, extensive. These are not what you are reading in Luke and Acts. He did not see it. He was not there for this. He went and did all this research and, and confirmed it through multiple eyewitness testimonies that this is true. And so his purpose is to write this for this man, Theophilus. And um, what we find, because he is writing to Theophilus, who is a member of the social elite, he is wealthy, again, we see Luke making sure he includes all these examples and testimonies about what the wealthy people did for the church, how many of the, the social elite became Christians, that he wanted to make sure that Theophilus knew it was not a poor man's religion. He wanted to make sure Theophilus knew that this is for everybody, that it is not just people that are below you. It is people that are across all social strata are, are becoming Christians. They are seeing the reality of this. And so you too, Theophilus, can become a Christian and can have rest, have security in the truth. And so because he is the one who this is written to, he's the money behind it, a lot of it you will notice as we go through Acts is geared towards speaking to him directly um, and making sure he knows and is able to relate to the things that have been going on. So, with that being said, his main objective, again, was not just with Theophilus, but it was to maintain, as he said in Luke 1, an orderly account and to record them as accurately as possible. We've already talked about that. I got ahead of myself. Got to stick to my notes. So let's go ahead and read Acts 1. Okay, we're going to read 1 through 11. Or I'm sorry, not chapters, verses 1 through 11. Okay, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to await the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you now at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were still gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood beside them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, 
He will come the same way you saw him go into heaven. The purpose of this introduction is to provide context for the early church. We see this in rhetoric, in the rhetoric of antiquity. We see that this is proper rhetoric. If you have a two volume, you summarize what was happening in the first volume so that you have an understanding of where they're beginning in the second volume. So that's what this is today. We are looking at the introduction to Acts. It is a summary of Luke, basically. It is just the very bare bones. This is Jesus Christ. He was crucified. He was raised from the dead. And he was, for, for 40 days and 40 nights, he was among the people. He was eating with them. He was drinking with them. He was doing these many proofs. He was alive. He was alive. And then he gave them their last command to be witnesses through the Holy Spirit to the ends of the earth. And then he was taken into heaven. And so this is the last scene we see that becomes, it's the last scene out of Luke that becomes then the introduction to Acts. That's what we're looking at today. Like I said before, the theme of this whole study is that of miracles. And what I mean by that is we're going to look at the miracles that God is doing that he did in history. But what I love about Acts, they don't stay on the pages of history. He's still doing them today. And so we're going to talk about the things that we see going on in each one of these chapters. And then we're going to talk about how he's still doing them today. And so the first miracle we're going to look at is the miracle of Jesus Christ. I struggled with this because, honestly, I was like, "Mm, how unoriginal. I really did. I was like, this is something that I feel, you know, coming from a New Testament background, I feel like we are hammered with Jesus Christ. And I myself, I become very, uh, not jaded, but, but, but it just, it doesn't become special anymore. I know Jesus died for my sins. I know he loves me. I just know it. It's not special to me anymore. And so my prayer for today is that he makes it special to us again. We need to know that this is incredible. This is a miracle. And we're going to do that because we're going to look from and see how God has been working this since the beginning of time. I love this idea. I was telling them earlier, I love the Old Testament. Like, I love the Old Testament. And so for me, I love to see how God works things in the Old Testament to come to fruition in the new. I love to see the prophecies that he that he told his prophets and that his prophets spoke about the things that would, wouldn't come true for hundreds, even thousands of years. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. So we're looking from the beginning of the Bible. We are going to look through and see what was said about Christ and why this is such a miracle. So we're going to look back at Genesis 12, 3. Some say all the way to Genesis 3, but I can't get behind that nearly as well as I can Genesis 12, 3. So real quick, God is um, talking to Abram. He's telling Abram, dude, I need you to leave your family. I need you to just go. Like, I don't care where. I'm going to show you where. Just go. And Abram's like, okay, I'll do it. So God tells him in 12, 3, he says, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who harm you. And by you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. It was not until thousands of years later that this came true. Abraham wasn't there to see it. He wasn't there to see the promises that God made him come true. We do, because we are on the other side. We get to see that God promised this to Abraham in the very beginning. And it took thousands of years, and he fulfilled it. He he fulfilled it. He was faithful to that promise. What this tells me is that this wasn't something that God, this wasn't a plan B for God. This was something he has been planning from the beginning of time. Now, this is silly. This is just in like, the crazy confines of my head, but I just think about the time, like, before they made 
the earth, before they made like the heavens and you know separated water from the land, made light and darkness. You think they had a conversation? This is like, I just keep thinking, they had to have a conversation like, are we really gonna do this? Do we really wanna go there? I just keep thinking like, you know, they, they could see from all time. This is what's gonna happen. This is, you're gonna have to do this, Jesus. Like, you're gonna have to go down there. You're gonna have to like go down there and you are gonna have to go through some really nasty stuff just to bring back these people who don't even want you to bring them back into relationship with us. Do we really wanna, do, we really wanna do this? And Jesus is like, yeah, let's do it. And so they did. And then we have Abraham. And he begins this line of Israelites that eventually birth this eternal king. It's incredible. We're going to turn next to 2 Samuel 7. And again, we see this. King David, the celebrated king of, king of Israel, God tells him. Or, well, the scene is that David, he is in his he is in his palace. He is sitting on his throne. And he is all of a sudden stricken with guilt. He, is finally, he goes up to Nathan, his, the prophet that was being used to tell him God's will. And he says, I'm sitting on this throne and my God is in a tent. I want to build him a house. And Nathan's like, yeah, all right, sounds good to me. God comes on the scene and he says, you are not the one to build me a house. But I'm going to build you a house. We pick up at 2 Samuel. He says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now the context here, God talks, starts talking about Solomon. David's son, who was chosen to build God a temple, and an incredible temple at that. But then at the very end, it says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, I know Solomon didn't live forever, but I know someone who came from him that did. And so again, we see God reiterating this promise that through Abraham will come this one, this Messiah, who will live on a throne, on a king's throne forever. This was not spur of the moment. This was planned, and God was working. He was molding history from the beginning of time to bring forth Jesus. Boggles my mind. Boggles my mind. Some say there's as many as 337 Old Testament prophecies that talk about Jesus. Now, I was not going to verify all those, so I found this really cool chart. Pick up this baby. There are 44 prophecies that I know of to be verified that talk about Jesus Christ specifically. So let's take a look at these. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm going to move through it pretty quickly, but I want to see, I want to show you that they do come from so many different places. They come from Genesis, from Micah, Isaiah, from Sam, 2 Samuel, Psalms, all over the Psalms, Daniel, Hosea, Jeremiah, Deuteronomy, all over the place. It wasn't just one person. God spoke these prophecies to multiple people, again, working through history to bring Jesus into, on the scene. So... The thing said about Jesus, he'd be born of a woman, he'd be born in Bethlehem, he'd be born of a virgin, he'd come from the line of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, he would come from the tribe of Judah, he would be heir to King David's throne, he would be anointed and eternal, he would be called Emmanuel, he would spend a season in Egypt, a massacre would happen at his birthplace, a messenger would prepare his way. He would be a prophet. He'd be preceded by Elijah, and he would be declared the son of God. He'd be a Nazarene. He would bring light to Galilee. He would speak in parables. He would heal the brokenhearted. He would be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Talk about a cool guy. Go look at him up. What happened here? I don't have it back. Oh, 
I got it. Thank you. You're awesome. Thank you. He would be called king. He would be praised by the little children. We're going to stop there for a moment. So we see, again, God is at work in all throughout the Old Testament. He is bringing Christ on the scene, and he is letting them know this man's a coming, and he is going to be incredible. He's going to blow your minds. The idea that he would come is in itself a miracle. He would come from heaven. He would leave his throne where it tells us in Revelation that angels are, their entire job is to say, holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord God Almighty. That he would leave that to come here. Knowing what would happen. Let's look at the back. Starting at number 25, it says, he'd be betrayed. His blood money would be used to buy a potter's field. He'd be falsely accused. He would be silent before his accusers, and they would spit upon him and strike him. He would be hated without cause. He would be crucified with criminals and given vinegar to drink. His hands and feet would be pierced. He would be mocked. He would be ridiculed. They would gamble for his clothes. His bones would not be broken, but he would be forsaken by God. He would pray for his enemies, and they would pierce his side. Jesus knew this was coming. This wasn't, this wasn't something, this wasn't a surprise to him. He's the one that told them the prophecy. He's the one that gave them the messages to speak. He knew. He knew this was coming, and still he chose to come for our sakes. I want to look at him for a moment. I want to look to Isaiah 53. I love this passage. Such a beautiful passage. They're going to pull it up right here. You can read along with me. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus came as a sacrifice for our sins. He came knowing all these things would happen to him. He came and knew these would happen, that he would have to fulfill this in order to bring us into relationship with him. Even though he knew he would be persecuted, betrayed, tortured, and murdered, he came because he loves me, he loves you, he loves every person on this earth more than we can ever comprehend. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read Isaiah 53 and I'm going to personalize it. I want you to do the same. As I am reading this, I want you to say, me, my, because that's exactly what it is. This is not abstract. He came to bear my grief. He came to carry my sorrows. He came to die in my place. He came so his chastisement would bring me peace. He came so that through his wounds, I am healed. He came to be sacrificed because he wanted a relationship with me more than the glory of his own throne. There is no greater miracle. We will not see a greater miracle as we look through Acts than Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He's our own personal miracle that we get to live out every single day. He's the miracle that brings every good thing into our lives. 
He's the miracle that breaks our chains and sets us free from guilt, from shame. Through the miracle of Christ, our days are full of peace and joy. And our future is filled with hope and excitement. We will not look at anything else so profound in our lives. That's all I have to say about that. If you have not accepted Christ into your life, or if you're not sure that you have, or you want to talk about it, give me a call, email me. I'd love to talk about it with you. Let's pray. Dear God, I praise you for you are good, you are faithful, and you are true. I praise you for this book that we get to study that gives us certainty, that gives us security in your truth, Lord. I thank you for you. I thank you for your sacrifice, for your love, that you would come down here for us, for me, for each person here tonight, Lord. I pray that you sit afresh on our hearts, that you just pour humility and joy and peace into us through your spirit, Lord that you wash us afresh in the miracle of you, of your coming, Lord. I pray that you are with each person in here, Lord, that you go with them tonight, that you whisper a message into their hearts, Lord, that you are near, that you love them, and that you are there through everything. I thank you for our time together, Lord, and I, I praise you for what you are working in our lives, for what you are going to do. I cannot wait to see how you work through this study, through these next nine weeks of our studies together, Lord. I cannot wait to see you show up and work. I pray you blow our minds. I pray that you expand our faith so that it will never again be shaken because you are good and you are faithful. In your precious and holy name, amen.